I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we are deep into our series on Lu Xun, and we're looking at one of his most, uh, if there was a word for getting punched in the guts, uh, you know, this is one of his most punching, punchy in the gut stories. Gut wrenching, uh, perhaps? Something like that. This is Zhu Fu, A New Year's Sacrifice. It's the first story in his second collection of short stories, that is, uh, Hesitations. And this was published on February 7th, 1924. And man, is it a really good story. Rob, you had never read this story, had you? Yeah, and you know, this is something I had to kind of admit as, as a literary scholar let's call ourselves scholars let's just let's go pretend. we both have phds we qualify let's just pre- <laughs> right let's just pretend you're supposed to have read the big stuff right it's it, there, you can't admit to say never having read james you joyce haven't read or something, proust right? have you yeah i've read proust i've read proust in french my friend you've only read him in translation i'm way i more actually did try and read you. him in french in french class and it was uh, a disaster but that's fine that's tough that's tough proust in french is can well proust in english <laughs> is tough anyway off topic if, if you're a Chinese lit scholar, especially in the modern era, it seems to me you have to have read this story already somewhere, and yet I don't remember having ever read it. I got a couple of pages in, I was like, wait a minute, I don't think I've read this, which was, I, f- I felt so deeply So this collection, I, like I said, is called Hesitations. It's not as famous as his first short story collection, Nahan, or War Cry, which has most of the big hitters. In Nahan, in War Cry, you've got Diary of a Madman, you've got AQ, you've got... Uh, a minor incident. You've got all of these Kongi Ji, yeah, yeah, the sort of classics. But what I love about this story is that it takes a, a, a very Lushunian perspective on gender. And Lushun was a huge feminist. I don't know if we've talked about that enough, but Lushun, he was in an arranged marriage. He, he agreed to do it, I think, for the sake of his mother, but he never actually lived with his his uh, legal wife. He actually uh, lived in sin, I guess we can still say, with uh, one of his students, famously. And this was uh, very progressive at the time. I mean, this is not the 1960s, the 1970s in the U.S. This was Beijing in the 1920s. So Lucian is this really progressive figure, and they had a, a very good relationship um, Lucian was very much a promoter of feminism well before feminism became popular in China, if you can even say it's popular now. I mean, with the feminist uh, crackdown going on, this story really just takes a lot of what Lucian philosophized about gender in essays like What Happens When Nora Leaves Home and and some of his other essay writings where he talks about his his feminism. And it wraps it in a literary package that I, I think was just stunningly good. It is a stunningly good story. It's a stunningly bleak story, but we'll get to that in a second. Let me let me just summarize it real quick. It's a first-person narration, and the narrator goes back to visit his uncle for the New Year sacrifice, the Lunar New Year. He runs into this beggar girl who who he re- recognizes as some a character who's just called throughout the story Xianglin's wife because she was once married to a guy named Xianglin who died and left her a widow. When she he runs into her and she asks him if he knows what happens when someone dies, what happens afterwards. And of course he's caught completely wrong footed and kind of just stammers, I don't really know, and then runs away. And the next thing he knows, she's dead. And then he relates her whole backstory. And it's a litany of horrors. Her first husband died, she worked in this home, her mother in law came her back and effectively sold her off to a guy in the mountains who gave her a son. And both that husband and son died. She comes back to try to work in the same place she was before with the uncle of the narrator. But that goes downhill because she's effectively an emotional wreck. And although everyone sympathizes with her in the beginning, by the end of the story, they're making fun of her and sort of treating her as sort of the town circus free sort of thing. And that's effectively it. The narrator sort of ruminates on this, this woman's plight, but... Sympathy is kind of hard to come by in this world. Yeah, L- L- Lucian doesn't really have any... His world does not really have sympathy. Rob, you mentioned that she's kind of an emotional wreck when she comes back. So her husband dies, and then her child is eaten by wolves, uh, and she blames herself. But But what's interesting is everybody else in the story implicitly blames her 
and and it's not blame in the way that you and I might think, like she was at fault, but actually she's considered both unlucky and polluted. So all women in this world are to a certain degree considered polluted, right? Like you have yin energy, that is yin of yin yang, uh, that that can uh, pollute the sacrificial meal that is for the ancestors, and the ancestors are all pretty much male. Ancestry is understood through the male line. So on the New Year's sacrifice, you are offering uh, food to uh, the ghost of your male ancestors and maybe uh, their wives, but but you know it's it's never to your mother's family. But you have to have uh, you have to be ritually pure. I mean, China is certainly not the only place where ideas of ritual purity come into play. It's very big in Hinduism and in, in Judaism. You of course have have the mikvah and the association of of women and menstruation and blood with this kind of ritual impurity. Uh, something similar is going on in this story, and that's a, a holdover from from classical Chinese thinking about gender and blood and ritual and the ancestors. And Lucian is implicitly criticizing that perspective. What's interesting to me is that Lucian gives the narrator of the story what feels to me like exactly the wrong kind of voice for this story, at least on the surface. And I'll talk more about why it actually works much better for me later. In that the narrator seems totally disaffected. There are very few, if any, passages where the narrator goes, you know what, geez, like, I just feel for this woman. It's such a hard life, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, the, the, the passage, in fact, <laughs> that really jumped out at me when he runs into her the first time, the very first time in the story, when she's already a beggar, she asks him what happens to a person after they die. His, his biggest concern isn't, oh my gosh, how did this woman become a beggar? It's, he feels sort of stupid because as a, as a great intellectual and academic, he can't answer her question. It's all about him. And then, <laughs> it's all about him. And then later on, when he finds out she's dead, and I'm going to read this from the level translation here, he says, Soon, I realized the thing I had dreaded was now past, that I now <laughs> that I no longer needed to dwell obsessively <laughs> on the business, on my I don't really know or his of being poor. So she dies, and his first thought is, I feel is, better. <laughs> oh, jeez, that's a relief now that she's not going to call me out for looking stupid. That's great. Like, wow, that's rough, man. And that's the narrator so, of the story. I'm glad you brought up the thing about the narrator um, because this narrator is socially oblivious. Like he does not, I mean, he's he's very much concerned about himself. Actually, he's only concerned about himself. He doesn't actually sympathize at all with the woman. He's interesting because he, at the very beginning, Rob, he seems to be a sort of progressive figure, right? He's he, The story starts out where he's yeah. visiting this town called Lu Jun. Um, Lu is, of course, the name that, the pin name that Lu Xun took. And Lu Jun means just, just kind of like Lu Town or something like that. And it looks a lot like Lu Xun's own hometown. So we're immediately set up wondering, is this narrator a stand-in for Lu Xun? But he seems so, so oblivious to everything. But then he's also a very progressive modern figure. He starts out by complaining that his uncle, a distant uncle who he's staying with, is is kind of uh, bad-mouthing some of the reformers, some of the progressive figures that this narrator associates himself with. And he he kind of goes like, you know, I know my uncle wasn't complaining about me personally, probably, but it still felt kind of weird. And and I wondered, what is progressive about this narrator? Because he's so oblivious to the, the like, pr- problem of class in his own life and the way he's able to just kind of disregard this this woman because she's poor and she's been sexually traumatized and used up in so many ways that he just doesn't have to care about her. And no one in this story ends up caring about her, do they? No, no one does. And what is at first glance a little strange about the narrator is the thing that sticks with me in this story because so many works of, let's call it social protest or political reform, something like that, we as readers want to believe we're a part of the the fight. We're a part of the revolution. We're better than those other people over there. And yet Lu Xun 
always puts us in this place that's much, much less comfortable. And we have to go, okay, so that's what I like to think I am, but am I really that? So reading this is fascinating because later in the story, when she comes back to work for the uncle's family for the second time. And this she, is this is after this is after her husband and has died and her son has been eaten, right? And she's telling her story, her sob story. Oh my gosh, I should have been better at this, blah, blah, blah. But she tells it so many times that people end up just going, whatever. But even before they start rolling their eyes at it, the way it's narrated, people flock to her to hear the story and cry and then go on about their business, right? They're sort of emotional tourists. I want to weep and feel feel better about myself as a human being because I've wept at this poor person's story. And then just kind of go on and do whatever, right? And that honestly tends to be the norm for most people, right? Is to be deeply moved by something and then on some level go, all right, and I'm kind of glad that's over with. I can kind of go on and get my groceries and cook dinner and stuff. One of the things that I thought was really fascinating is the way the narrator just kind of disregards her and her problems. And, you know, when he when he learns that she's died, he goes, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> it's all it's all it's all taken care of. Yeah. But that, yeah, that behavior, that attitude is replicated in the story. Do you remember the go between Rob? Yeah. Yes, so Mrs. Mrs. Wei mm-hmm. is the woman who arranges for uh, Sister Shangling to uh, come from whatever village she's at and then uh, be a servant in the uncle's house. And uh, when uh, Shangling's parents come back, they actually end up kidnapping her, like physically, violently uh, tying her up, throwing her into a boat after having surveilled her and, and, and realized that it was her. Uh, apparently, she, she ran off. Um, so Mrs. Wei, the go-between comes to the narrator's family and goes, oh, geez, sorry about that. I uh, I had no idea she was a runaway. I'm sorry to have embarrassed you. Um, she's not at all like concerned about uh, Shangling, uh, Sister Shangling herself. She's mostly concerned about the face of the family who she was hired to, to find the servant for. Later on in the story, as we learn more about what happened to Sister Shanglin, the go-between, Mrs. Wei, goes, oh, yeah, yeah, things are actually getting looking up for, for her because the girl, Sister Shanglin, had been, she got married. And then she tells the story of the marriage, which that is the, the, the most horrific part of this whole story, is she doesn't want to get remarried. She bashes her head against a stone to try and kill herself during the marriage ceremony. She's thrown into the bridal chamber, raped, and doesn't wake up for a day or two. She's raped. She physically injures herself. She's impregnated, apparently. The the go-between just goes, things are looking up for her because she got married. And, and, and so, you know, everything's hunky-dory. And I was like, oh, what is happening? This this yeah. is just so disgusting and disturbing. I mean, I, I almost got a little sick at, while reading it. Yeah. Let me ask you this question, too, because writers are often sort of go-betweens with their subjects and their readers. To what extent do you see Lu Xun setting either himself or the narrator up alongside Mrs. Wei in the same sort of calloused go-between state? I definitely think there's something there. You know, they are this kind of medium through which we have to pass to get access to the story. And the interesting thing about this narrator is that they're almost, we're never told this, but to me it seemed like there are really two narrators in this story. There's the idiot guy who's completely self-obsessed and who runs into Sister Shanglin when he's going back to his village. And then there's another narrator who seems to be an omniscient narrator who has access to all of this information that there's no real way that this this guy who's just come back to his village for a couple of days for for New Year's would have access to. He knows so many details about Sister Shanglin's life that you have to wonder, is Lucian doing something with the narrator, teasing out epistemological questions as he did in Diary of a Madman, Kuang Rin Ruji? Well, what's interesting, and as I read the story, one of the reasons the narrator knows so much is because 
he goes back regularly to visit his uncle for the New Year's sacrifice and used to see Xiangling when she was going about her tasks. So maybe he's known a good bit about her before. But what's interesting, what regardless of, of how he got the information, the structure of the story is interesting because we haven't mentioned this yet, but we don't start off with the history of Xiangling's wife. We start off with the narrator coming back and going, holy cow, my uncle's house is boring. I need to get out of here, right? Not only boring, but also just very anti-progressive, kind of anti... He's very against the new social movements that are bubbling up inside China at this time. And he's also clearly a Neo-Confucian. You know, you uh, you have a calligraphic work from Chu Xi, the founder of Neo-Confucianism, which states, when the principles are in place, the mind is at peace. And, and, and it's forcing you to ask, in this, in this house where it's supposedly practicing good ritual, emphasizing the idea of, of being right, morally right, but then this horrific thing is happening and they're doing nothing about it. There's this disconnect. There's, uh, I mean, it's, it's irony. On one level, they are being morally upright. And on another level, they're being just complete, being completely reprehensible. I was about to say, careful with that word choice. There's a lot of words we could go with here, but we might get a different rating on the podcast sites we use. Well, what's interesting about all of that is clearly the narrator sees himself as not this kind of person. He wants to get out of here, right? But his encounter with Xiangling demonstrates that he doesn't care any more about her than anyone else does until it comes time to tell her story, until it comes time to do a bit of writing, and then he's all in. He's like, I'm going to tell you all about this woman, where she came from, how she got to where she was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the first part of the story, which is just him talking about going back to his village and running into her right before she dies, I want to say it's like two pages, maybe three pages, super quick. The rest of the story is her backstory. And it's interesting to see this because this story is written after War Cry, but shortly before Wild Grass, which is a far more existentially troubled work than the others he's written. And it's easy for me, at least, to see the story as almost a transition point, right? So War Cry is sort of him going, hang on, it is it is entirely possible that... that participating in a literary reform is going to actually change everything, right? But Wild Grass is very much not that, right? So New Year's Sacrifice has a narrator who doesn't care about a subject until she's a subject, until she's the topic of a piece of writing he can maybe get published or share with someone, right? And before that, he could frankly care less. She, he runs into this poor beggar woman who's just looking for a bit of comfort. His self-obsession has him flee and basically hide from her until she's dead. But then he's all over. Like, oh, I, 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 now that I can write about it, let me let me get right into this. So it's, an, it's, it's, for me at least, a kind of subtle commentary on maybe some implicit cynicism lurking in the hearts of most of these kinds of writers where they're eager to tell the people's quote-unquote story, the poor person's story, the abused woman's story, just as long as they're at a yeah, as distance. long as they don't get blood on their hands. Yeah, as long as they don't have to actually participate, they're, they're passionate, passionate critics. They're, they're ready to, to just dive right in, you know, in their comfortable well-appointed libraries far away right, this from is kind of a, 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 a limousine progressive critique of uh, in, you know translated into 1920s china that's that's how that's one of the ways i read it yeah for sure now what 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 i love about it what i love about it is if you are a even if you are even slightly self-conscious and i say that in just the the textbook way not a negative way if you are aware of yourself as a scholar as a writer um, someone who studies literature, you have to see yourself in this narrator. You have to see the, the kinds of people who will write about Marxist critiques of this and that and this and that and the problems of society are themselves also totally willing to spend years writing treatises about the ills of society, but are probably not going to get down in the trenches and put their arms around a beggar and help them feel better. There, there is, I think in every society, you have 
folks who are willing to, you know, play the symbolic politics of being progressive, but aren't willing to, in their own lives, enact the changes that they're saying need to be enacted. And what's particularly damning in this story is that Lu Xun is one of these people himself. I do not know to what extent we can read the narrator as Lu Xun. This is, an, again, a classic Lu Xun move. Like, we don't know if he, this is him or not. This narrator looks a lot like Lu Xun. He's from a high-class family, returning home, uh, probably somewhere in the south, I believe. That is the, the area around Jiangnan, near kind of Shanghai. Uh, Lu Xun is from Shaoxing, just you know, an hour or two from modern-day Shanghai. Uh, and, and I believe we know that based off of the the particular type of sacrifice, Zhu Fu, is a uh, sacrifice. I believe it's associated with that region. And so I, I think we really have to ask, you know, is Lu Xun being self-conscious? Is he being self-critical? Is that his message? And this is, wouldn't be the first time, right? I mean, that's the whole point of the opening to War Cry, which we talked about with Professor Roy Chan, is whether, again, whether or not it's true, who knows, but he narrates himself having gone through a slump where he just basically gave up writing altogether and deciding the whole thing was hopeless. And then someone talks him into writing the stories that will eventually become War Cry. He writes that, he writes this, then he writes Wild Grass, which is yet another retreat. And after that, so far as I know, he doesn't compose either any fiction or much fiction. He goes to writing very short essays, zawen, which are a little more, almost like blog posts. 1920s Chinese blog posts, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so he has these peaks and valleys. He seems to believe in the cause, and then he just does it. And then he believes, and then he does it. And that, to me, is the pattern of someone who really is invested. It's it's someone who isn't just sitting in a library. It's someone who's really looking around and saying, look, I've been writing a long time, and I don't see any change happening. How do you grapple with that? How do you deal with that? Well, one of the ways Lu Xun deals with it by giving us narrators, you know, like this, this narrator actually really reminded me of the the narrator in Yi Jian Shao Shi, uh, a minor incident. Uh, we did an, a dis- had a discussion with Alec Ash on this, and the 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 way that the narrator kind of could be Lucian, we have some subtle signs that it might not be Lucian. Um, is is something, but it's clearly something that Lucian, the author, is playing with. What is the relationship between Lucian, the author, and the the unnamed narrator in the story. So, Lee, right before we started the podcast, you began talking about something, and I cut you off and told you to save it for the podcast. So you said you've taught the story to your students several times anyway. I- I'm dying to know, how did they respond to this thing? Um, a lot of my students from the PRC see it purely as a critique of a feudal society and that Lucian is just saying, you know, we need to get rid of these old ideas about about gender and and feudalism. Um, and I think that's definitely there. That is the sort of standard reading that you have to have in the PRC, and there's no other way to understand it. But I, I, as with Diary of a Madman, I think the story is so much more complicated. I mean, these issues we've discussed with the, the narratorial voice, the questions of whether or not Lucian is implicated in this whole thing, uh, it's such a complicated story. We've, For the whole podcast series, we've been ar- arguing that Lucian deserves to be treated like a modernist. He needs to be in the pantheon with Joyce, with Proust, with Kafka. I think this story is is really a modern, a modernist masterpiece in that you have all these epistemological questions. You can read it as this critique of uh, uh, old-fashioned uh, thinking, but there's so much more going on in this story. The the politics are on the nose. There's clearly a woman who has been treated like dirt her whole life entirely because of an outdated ethical system, right? You said treated like dirt. I want to take issue with that language. I actually think as we sort of wrap up, you know, there's so much discussion in the story of her kind of being used up. Um uh, almost consumed like it it in when when the unnamed narrator first meets her it, it he describes her almost as like a a piece of a uh, piece of food that's been left out for too long and and my question is the story is called new year's sacrifice is she 
the thing that's being sacrificed? Is she the thing that is being consumed for these upper class people to uh, sacrifice to the male ancestor line? Like, is is are low class women what are being consumed by upper class men in the story? Is that the point? I, I would uh, I would say yes. But this is what I love about Lu Xun, or one of the things I love about Lu Xun. Yes, but, and there are always ellipses after that, that is a part of it. But then the follow-up is, with this narrator, you can see two things happening at the same time. One is Lu Xun saying to his readers, this person has been sacrificed to maintain an order that really we should be phasing out. But with a narrator, this disaffected and vain and out of touch, the follow-up question is, so why do you care? Like, what are you going to do about it? You, you feel bad when you read the story, and then what? You're going to read the next story? You're going to put it on the shelf and go eat dinner? I think we should just end by reading uh, Lovell's translation of that last little bit of the story. Um, so the, the unnamed narrator... Uh, that he's talking about what's wrong with Shangling's wife, the aunt says. Uh, there's this, this discussion of uh, Shangling's wife. Then we have this, this break in the narrative, and the unnamed narrator says, I woke with a start to a particularly raucous blaze of firecrackers nearby. The yellow flame in the lamp next to me had shrunk to the size of a bean. Then I heard a further sequence of uh, spluttering bangs. Uncle was making his New Year's sacrifice. Dawn could not be far off. Somewhere in the distance, I heard the faint machine gun rattle of yet more firecrackers as a dense cloud of sound and snowflakes blanketed the town. I accepted its comfortable, torpid embrace, letting the New Year's sacrifice cleanse me of the doubts and misgivings that had troubled me all day. Having sated themselves on offerings and incense. The spirits of heaven and earth were lurching drunkenly about the sky, preparing to bestow joy everlasting on the good burgers of Lu Jun. Um, there is this sense that Sister Shanglin, uh, Shanglin's wife, that she has been consumed for the, the, the folks who live in the city, for the, the obviously, the, the wealthy folks who live in the city. It's brutal. It's... It's Lucian both calling people to arms like he did in Nahan and also saying that if the work of fiction is nothing but words on a page... What does it mean? Then, ref, then, then it, either it doesn't mean anything or the reform that we're talking about is impossible. And on that bleak note, I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.